Hawo, Shalom, Ras Tefari. Hine, Ras Yadinos Tefari, Hine. We want to say, um, a Melkam, the Allen Gusen, the guest, uh, a Zod, ye Zod, the Al, um, Adarasacho, Melkam, uh, ye Nugusen, the guest, uh, um, the Al, the Al is the, is the holy day or the, for us, it's a metasebia, it's a remembrance of the crowning of the of the king of kings of Ethiopia, the true and earth's rightful ruler. Now, we want to touch on right here, seeing that this is the this is the eve of um, coronation, of the coronation of the king of kings, Kadamawi Haile Selassie. Now, there's a very important but often missed uh, missed opportunity of of true revelation in the word of God because the half of the story concerning his imperial majesty has been suppressed, ha has been ignored, and this too is prophesied. But we're on the eve of the 81st coronation anniversary Metasebia Memorial of Kedamawi Haile Selassie or more correctly, Moa Andesa the Emma Negeta Yehuda Keramawi Haila Salase Suyuma Ekziavir Nagusa Neges Ze Echopia. Now what is what is the significance of the crowning of the King of Kings? Well first of all, as many of the first proclaimers of, of Aras de Ferri, namely um Reverend James Morris Webb, who we've spoken of and we're also writing and seeking to publish concerning this unsung first or one of the first, definitely before Marcus Messiah Garvey. But true, the the present imperfect record of um Rastafari revelation that's currently available, if you look up, will attribute this prophecy and proclamation of the King of Kings to Marcus Messiah Garvey, but that is an error, my brothers and sisters. Yes, he did proclaim it, but he was not the first proclaimer, the first proclaimer on record so far that we have been able to um, substantiate prior to Marcus Messiah Garvey was the African-American Reverend James Morris Webb, and he has a wealth of of literature and, and evidence on record that shows that, first of all, he proclaimed, look to Africa where a black man will be crowned king. In him you will find the Redeemer. Now this is very significant because Reverend James Morris Webb was a reverend. So he, he understood the word much better than Garvey. Now the connection between Reverend James Morris Webb and Marcus Garvey is the fact that Reverend James Morris Webb was a member of the UNIA and he had joined the Marcus Garvey, um, you could say, movement or the United Negro Improvement Association. But later on, him as well as many other first proclaimers of Rastafari, and this is the interesting thing for the history, that many of these brothers on the record were first of all African American. Secondly, they were either clergymen, reverends, pastors, preachers, and even rabbis. African American, black Hebrews, and black Jews and Judeo Christians. Now, this is part of the suppressed history of I and I, which the Rastafari, the true Rastafari faithful, and this society of his imperial majesty, the line of Judah, proclaim. It's not to so called take anything away from Garvey, but to set the record straight. Because ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And we're living in this time of um restoration, this time of renewal. We're on the eve of both the King of Kings Coronation Day, which unfortunately the careless Ethiopians no longer observe or recognize. But the true Rastafari, we recognize, we celebrate it, we honor it. But now there's a very important mathematics 
They say that mathematics is a precise science, math and, and numbers. And this revelation came to I and I heart as I and I was meditating that we have been teaching and preaching on uh, Noch, you understand, or Ye, Ye Noch or Noach, which is Noach is a Hebraic or modern Jewish way of saying Noah, and in the Ethiopic of His Majesty's Bible, it is Noch. His name is Noch. Now, we made the link with Noah and the Ankh, at least at a basic level. Yah willing, we'll go into a little bit more deeper. But this particular week, or, or Samint that we're in, which is witnessing in the year 2011, this very year, is witnessing the 81st coronation of His Imperial Majesty is significant in more ways than one. Now, what do we mean that is significant in more ways than one? Well, first of all, this is the 81st. So make a note of that, mathematical number, the 81st. Secondly, it's 2011. 2011 is the eve of 2012. And we've already been seeing affirmative signs of the 2012 prophecy from the Mayan perspective, but also for us, Keely, from the scriptures. So what the Mayans may have seen of 2012 and other ancient cultures, we also have in the Bible and in the scriptures, especially when we rightly divide the word of truth. But first, we must study and show ourselves approved. So my brothers and sisters and mothers, I'd like to share a little bit of the mathematics that the Holy Spirit has illuminated to me concerning this 81st coronation of His Imperial Majesty 2011. This is the eve, November 1st, 2011, and the new light, November 2nd, is the day. Now, for us, it is the Wazema, uh, Wazema, the eve that's very important for us. It's the eve. For example, if if the day is Passover, it's the evening before that. It's that evening and morning from the very beginning that we have to be cognizant of. See, from the Western Gentile perspective, they're always a day late. But Jah has made I and I the head and not the tail, that we should know these things. And the key significance is for us to be prepared. So it's these studies of Torah, these studies of the scriptures, the prayers and the meditation that is to make us prepared in soul, in spirit, in soul, and in body, in the tripartite being. That is the image that we've been created in, in the image of the true Ha Elohim, of the true Hashem. Now let's let's touch on a couple of basic mathematical um, proofs as well as signs concerning this 81st coronation of His Imperial Majesty. Kedemawi Halaslazi. Firstly, this is the. 81st coronation, right? 81st coronation. Now, let's look at the number 81st. Now, if you recall, they tell us that His Imperial Majesty was how old? They say 81. That's significant. What portion of Torah are we studying currently right now? We are studying the... Torah portion that's known as Noah or Noah. Now we're going to touch on that. Let's put this right here for a moment. It was in, they say, 1975, right? They say that His Imperial Majesty, according to them, died. Some say He was murdered. Some say He was strangled. Some say He was crucified. I and I say that He was crucified. As they did to the son, so will they do to the father. The son has witnessed that. Now, if 1975, what year is it? It's 2011, right? It's 2011. So what is the differential? Some would say mathematically we should have put this on top. But it's very easy to see. 
because this will be 25 and this will be 11 and 25 and 11 is what? 25 and 11 is 36 years. Now, 36, keep this in mind, 36. So it's been 36 years since His Imperial Majesty's crucifixion in Ethiopia. But now we as the Rastafari faithful know that even though they said he died, we know, behold, he is the one who was dead, but lives. Now he lives the identity of Abba as Abba could do. Now, his imperial majesty was born when? 1892. Let's put this here as well. 1892. Now, 1892, if we put 2012, how long is this? What's the difference between this? This is 120 years. So from 1892 to 2012 is 120 years. Is there anything significant scripturally? Is there anything significant in Scripture? Now, we have a couple set of numbers. Take this down. First of all, we're going to go to the Scriptures. We're going to look at the Torah portion that we're in right now. And the Torah portion that we're in right now is called Yenoch in the Ethiopic or Noach in the Hebraic. So, in Genesis chapter 6, Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, here is subscribed the warning of Jehovah, the warning of Yahweh. Now, what does it read? It says, And the Lord, or yod heh wow -Heh, said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he, a particular he, or that he, and they say, for man is also flesh, but that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be and 120 years, his days. So if we would look from 1892 to 2012, we see how this is 120 years. Now, remember this, this number right here. We're going to remove this for a moment. We're going to bring it back into play because what we want to look at now is we want to look at what, does, what is the significance now, right? What is the significance of 81? Now, see, here's what was very interesting, right? Was that when we looked at 81, right? We said, first of all, we have to touch on, let's look at when was His Majesty coronated? 1930. Now, there's a prophecy, a beautiful prophecy in Isaiah concerning that year. Now that year, excuse me, that year, 1930, that year is known in the scriptures as the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, those who have studied scripture, and it's important to study scripture, especially for us, and if we are going to seek to rightly divide the word of truth, we need to study the scriptures. Now, here in Isaiah chapter 61, in Isaiah chapter 61, it speaks of two advents. There are two advents that are in one view. Now, what are these two advents that scripture says that are in one view? First of all, we have to observe that Yeshua or Jesus or Jesus, he suspended the reading of this particular passage that comes from Isaiah chapter 61. He suspended the reading of this passage in the synagogue at Nazareth. So Jesus Christos was in the synagogue at Nazareth, and he went up for the Aliyah, and where the Torah scrolls were rolled out and opened, and he took hold on the tree of life. You understand? Which is the handles of the Torah scroll. And he read this particular passage. So it's clear to us that he was reading the prophetical or the Haftarah. Yes, Yeshua read the Haftarah in Luke chapter 4. 
verses 16 to 21. So our form of Torah studies, we can trace it all the way to the period of the disciples and to the Lord, Yeshua, Adonenu, our black Lord and Savior himself. This is key. This is significant because this shows this was the rightful way to study scriptures even of the Messiah himself. Now, here it reads that the Spirit of the Lord God, Adonai Yahweh, is upon me because Yahweh hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Now, it's right here that they say to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the acceptable year of Yahweh, or Jehovah, if you please, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Now, we have to observe that Jesus, yes, so he suspended the reading of this passage in the synagogue at Nazareth, at the comma in the middle of Isaiah 61 and 2. Now, what is the meaning of this? This is very important to understand the mystery of the father of Kedamawi Hala Selassie and of the son, Jesus Christos, of the first advent, which is the advent of our black Lord and Savior Yeshua, or Jesus Christ, if you please, and the second advent, the Rastafari revelation of the King of Kings. Because when Jesus was in the synagogue, the first advent, Therefore, it opened the day of grace. This was open the day of grace, or the acceptable year of Yahweh. But it does not fulfill the day of vengeance. So Yeshua came to proclaim the acceptable year, more correctly, the acceptable age. There will be acceptable age, or what we know as the messianic age or what others call the Christian age, which now has come to fulfillment in the Rastafari revelation. Now, how do we know this? Well, let's read and study on. That will be taken up when the Messiah returns. So what Christ read was up to, to proclaim the acceptable year of Yahweh. And it says that, and then he closed it up. He closed the Torah scrolls at that particular point. So he suspended the reading in the synagogue in Nazareth at half of this sentence, which is very, very interesting and something that many in studying have not really paid close attention to. But it provides several keys because the acceptable year in Rastafari Revelation, no doubt, is 1930. You see, because 1930 was the coronation of the God-man, King of Kings. Now, why is that so significant? Because Adam, Adam was actually the first king. But his kingdom, his dominion, we can say, was taken from him. And every time there was kingship, even up to the Davidic time, it has gone through great suffering and affliction. And then it was, it was sealed up. In that land, Ethiopia, thus David even proclaims, Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands to God. And it speaks about Ethiopia. This man was born there. Now, these are very clear scriptures in the Bible. It's very hard for people just to dismiss this. It's there in the Bible, but give an explanation of it. Would it just be saying that Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands to God? After it says princes shall come out of Egypt, the princes coming out of Egypt is connected with the Exodus. And the interesting part of the story in the Exodus concerning Moses is Moses' Ethiopian wife. Now, why is this significant? Because also in Amos 9 and 7, what does it say to us? Amos 9 and 7 clearly says, Aren't ye like the children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel? So we get these overlapping signs and indication that there's an Ethiopia link. Now the fulfillment of all these links have been made in the person of the conquering line of the tribe of Judah, Kedamawi Haile Selassie. 
siyuma eke zi abi her binugusinigas ze Ethiopia, or the conquering line of the tribe of Judah, Haile Selassie I, elect of God, king of kings of Ethiopia. This is the Rastafari revelation, which fulfills and confirms the scripture, and is also verifiable by true history, the true story of the 20th, and now we're into the so-called 21st century. Now, there's a very key connection, because from 1930, let's do the math, 1930 to 2011, what do we have here? 1930 to 2011, we have 81 years. Now, notice something about this number 81. 81 comes up a couple of times in Rastafari Revelation. First of all, 81 comes up in connection with this year, 2011, right? Secondly, 81 comes up in connection with the age, they say, of His Majesty when His Majesty, quote, died, end quote. Now, to the death of the imperial majesty, the divine response, there is a divine response, Rastafari, when they speak of the death of his majesty or his majesty dying by whatever way that they want to assume. There's, there's, there's a real to that, if we would understand or overstand our caduce. When well, we turn to Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, and we go to verse 17 and 18. This is where John, right? John, he sees he sees Christ in a vision, or he sees a vision of the one who says to him, first of all, it tells us that I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, when is the Lord's day? See, some would say the Lord's day was Sunday. Others would say, in the context, salvation being of the Jews, according to our black Lord and Savior, the Lord's day was the Shabbat day. And he heard behind, he says, I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamos and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Now, it's very important for us to understand the significance of these seven churches. The seven churches represent seven ages of the, 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 the Christianity or of the Christian church. The Christian church or the church of Christ will go through seven different ages which are represented by the word and the message of the Spirit to the various different churches or the angels of those churches. Now, in verse 12, it says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now, what is very interesting is that everything that it describes right here is tabernacle. It's impossible to understand this from a Gentile misunderstanding. One needs to have the Hebraic template in mind to really see what Johannes or John saw and to understand or overstand the meaning. Now it says, in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like to the Son of Man clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass, as if they burned in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of 
many waters. Now, the interpretations on this are diverse and very interesting, but the clear interpretation is the description of this particular man or of this son of man, the one who is like the son of man. Notice, in the text, it does not state, I am Jesus Christ. Notice it doesn't say that. Though there's a connection in the triune God, of course, with the Son, because the Son is the express image of the Father. This is what is the key. Now it says that in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a girdle down to the foot and girdled about the paps with a golden girdle, his head and his ears were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like, were as, excuse me, a flame of fire, and his feet like to fine brass, as if they burnt in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Now, for many of I and I, when we read this, we see a clear description of the humanity of Christ, that his humanity was black. He was a black man, what we would call today a black man. This was showing his humanity. It's giving a description of his hairs. It's giving a description of his complexion. It's giving a description of his unique voice. And we know that the black voice is unique by far in comparison to every other voice. Thus, we have soul, music, and so forth, and so on. But it goes on to say in verse 16, And he had in his right hand seven stars. The seven stars, the Pleiades in the Taurus constellation. This is what he had in his hand. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength, his countenance was likened unto the sun. So it's using these metaphors, and some of these metaphors over time in different ages have become mythological. So there's a connection with his countenance or his face is like the sun. So not saying that he is the sun, but he is likened to the sun by reason of the shine and in his strength. Now, here's the key in verse 17. It says, and when I saw him, now when Johannes saw this one, he says, I fell at his feet as dead, that he fell down at this one's feet as dead when he beheld him. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying to me, fear not, I am the first and the last. Now, here's another key significance concerning Edomawi Hala Selassie. We say, Haile Selassie the first, or some would say, Haile Selassie I, but that I really means the first. So more correctly, Edomawi Haile Selassie can be interpreted the first Haile Selassie or Haile Selassie the first. Yet he is the last king of kings of Ethiopia. Now, this is very significant. This is a key significance that maybe the haters of his majesty overlooked in their rush, you understand, in their rush to commit rebellion against the king of kings, to bite the hand that fed them. And we're speaking of the careless Ethiopians. Now, the judgment on them we find in Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 12, when it says, ye Ethiopians also shall be slain by my sword, we get the manifestation of it. And even there's a residual of that to this very day until the repentance. You see, there must be a repentance, a return. Hosea speaks of this, that he will hide his face until his people acknowledge their fall and they repent and they seek him. And they seek him. Now, time is running out. You see, the time is running out. So this is what we, what we're getting a confluence of signs. You understand? Signs in heaven and signs on earth. Now, for the Sadiqan, for the righteous, this further affirms our faith. For the wicked and the heathen, they are dismayed by these signs. So now we're seeing all these signs as we're coming into so-called 2012. Now, in 2011, we're at the 81st. So the 81st is both 
the remember this is the eve of 2012 right now 2012 is uh, prophesied and some say expected and some say with the climatic changes will change everything in other words this is a time of change where many who have studied the matter thoroughly even some from a biblical perspective and said I don't know too much about the Mayans but what, what the Mayans are saying seems to be what the Bible is saying and look look around we're seeing these signs in real time and they're increasing ever increasing and we've been seeing them ever since really 2010 we've been announcing that 2010 may have actually been a a fourth shadowing as to say some would say the real 2012 because certain signs that are talked about alignments happening in 2012 we got a fourth taste of it in 2010 so this year also is very very you know this year is not over yet and the snowstorm up here on the eve of of Halloween is significant it's very, very significant. There's still millions of people up here in this region who don't have any power, who are in the dark and in the cold. And this is this is something that is almost one of the worst things that's happened from, from a storm that they didn't expect to do such damage. So this is also very, this is another positive sign for I and I, for those who are, awake and aware to say hmm amen amen now here it says this is the answer to those who speak of Haile Selassie died at 81 we say I am he that liveth and was dead so he says I am he Albert Caduce is he who liveth you understand who lives He's the living one, and he was dead. In other words, he is the one that they call Hila Selassie, but he is living, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Now, here's what's very interesting about this. It says he has the keys of what? of hell and of death of hell and of death now there's a note right here to Luke 16:23 should we go there why not let's go to 16:23 of Luke 16:23 so in Luke chapter 16 verse 23 it says this is concerning the rich man and Lazarus. How interesting. Because this is exactly what we're witnessing. The, the, the woes of the rich. And we're seeing the whole rich and poor. We're seeing the rich man and the Lazaruses. Or the Osiruses. The Eleazars. It says right here that. And in hell. This uh, a rich man. He lifted up his eyes. Being in Sheol. Or the Duat being in torments and seeing Abraham, seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus or Eliasar or El Osar in his bosom. Now there's a footnote here and the footnote says that this is in the Greek Hades. They call this the unseen world. So there are worlds such as Sheol or Hades, or in ancient Egypt, they call the Duat, which are not seen, but they are worlds in and of themselves. Now, the unseen world is revealed as the place of departed human spirits between death, they say, and the resurrection. Now, this word occurs in many other chapters. In the Old Testament, it's the Sheol. But in the Septuagint, they render Sheol by the Greek Hades because their idea of Hades. Now, Hades, when you connect that with ancient Egypt, that's the Duat. Or some would call that the Amenta, the Duat and the Amenta. Now, as we get into that, that also becomes interesting. But the most interesting is, thing is that the 
one who speaks in the red letters, who is attributed to be Christ, but is it God the Father or God the Son? Or is it God speaking? And therefore, God the Father and God the Son may be rightly interpreted in the red letters of Revelation. How do we know? When we go to Revelation chapter 1, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him. So it was Yeshua HaMoshiach's revelation, but who gave it to him? It was God, or his father, our father, for what purpose? To shew to his servants things which must shortly come to pass. So though it's a message that everybody can read and look at and try to give their own interpretations, it was given to the servants. It was given to Jesus Christ and God his Father's servants to show them things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. So it was sent by way of messenger. In other words, it was the revelation of God. God gave this to the Son, to Jesus Christ, to show to his servant things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and he signified it. That means not just sending it, but also the signification of it, or the signifying of it by his angel, by the fact that it was given under divine authority of Melaku, Melaku, his angel to who? To his servant John. Now, John's name is interesting. John means the grace of Yahweh. So now, grace is a very messianic message of the Moshiach. Grace. Grace is also a Christian theme, a main Christian theme. But whose grace is it? The, the son, Yeshua, says the grace of his father. So it's interesting that in the red letters of the Bible, it does not state, I am Jesus, but it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Right, the revelation of Yeshua HaMoshiach, whom Ha Elohim gave to him and sent it for the servants, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. So we see the order. There's a particular divine order now. Let us continue with this right here because this is our main message right here about the coronation. His Imperial Majesty's coronation, 2011, is the 81st. Now, when we were looking over this, we found some interesting things that His Majesty was said to be 81 years old, right? If you look at the report, he's, he's 81, though some would hedge it and say maybe he was 82. Right, but now notice this. This is one year before 2012. Now, if 2012 is really an end date, now get this: in 1970, what was it? In 1974, 75, His Majesty was 81. The godless and creeping coup opposed him, and His Majesty came off the throne. He stepped down off of the throne at the age of 81, right? But now this was one year before the disaster date for Ethiopia, before Ethiopia went through its own form of Hades and hell. And still, it has not, it has not gotten on the right track as of yet. Now, at this point here in the coronation, 81st coronation, we're on the eve of 2012. You understand? So it's, and, and as we go through the majority of 2012, we're going to be in the energy of the 81. So the first thing, when I was looking at these things, my brothers and sisters, I said, let's look at the Psalms, because there's many messianic Psalms. So we open our Bible, this Bible right here, actually, and we said, let's go to the 81st Psalm and see what's written. Now, in the 81st Psalm, 
it says right here, it says to the chief musician upon Gittith, a psalm of Asaph, it says, sing aloud to God our strength. Make a joyful noise to the Elohim of Yaakov, the God of Jacob. Take a psalm, take a psalm speaking mainly of these psalms of David, and bring it hither a timbrel or the kabro, what Rastafari called the harps, or a drum. The pleasant harp with psaltery. Blow up the trumpet in the new moon. Blow up the trumpet in the new moon in the time appointed. Ah, the key word. In the what? In the time appointed, that means there are certain times that are appointed, right, on our solemn feast day. The coronation day for us, especially since the godless events against the elect of God in 1974 and 75, the coronation of Negus Negus, Zet Ethiopia, the king of kings of Ethiopia, for I and I as Arastafari, and elect Ethiopian Hebrews, is indeed both in time appointed and it's also our I and I solemn day. And it goes on and says, For this was a statute for Israel and a law of the God of Jacob. Now, the King of Kings coronation day is and was a true holy day for Ethiopian Hebrews at home and abroad. But you see, they sought to change laws and times. This is why Zephaniah 2 and 12 is made for the careless Ethiopians who betrayed his majesty in particular. Because this was a statute for Israel and a law of the God of Yaakov, of the God of Ethiopia, because Ethiopia shall soon stretch her hands to God. And Ethiopia stretched forth her hands to the true God, who is the God of Yaakov, or the God of Jacob. And it says, This he ordained in Joseph for a testimony. This was ordained in Joseph. Remember, Joseph was in Egypt, as we are in a spiritual Egypt. When he went out through the land where I heard a language that I understood not, really, that he did not understand. Like many of us may use English, but when you start looking at the etymology of the English, what's really behind the English, then you begin to overstand it in the true understanding way. But before that, you really don't understand this language. It's a strange language. So I removed his shoulder from the burden. Emancipation. His hands were delivered from the pots. Proclamation. Thou callest in trouble and I delivered thee. 1955. During the Brown versus Board of Education, His Majesty spoke before the the Joint Houses of um, of of Congress, and he spoke on these issues. You understand of of the dignity, human dignity, and 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 the black man in America was a main focus of Haile Selassie the first. These are the half of the story they don't tell you. That when the Brown versus Board of Education was passed, His Imperial Majesty was present, speaking to these Gentiles and Goyans and warning them about what they were doing to His people, us as the so-called lost sheep in the Americas. They don't tell you this in their so-called civil rights history because this is half of the story that they hide from us. But this is the half of the story. This is the truth and nothing but the truth. So look it up. You'll find it out. It says, I answer thee in the secret place of thunder. I prove thee at the waters of Meribah, Selah. Now here's an interesting thing that happened. 
because it's talking about what happened to the Israelites. But then look at this lost sheep of Israelites or black folks that don't know themselves as Beta Israel in the Americas. They were proved at the waters of Meribah. And Meribah mean like the bitter, one could say the bitter testing waters, Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will testify to thee, O Israel, if thou will hearken, if you will listen to me. There shall no strange God be in thee, neither shall thou worship any strange God. But that generation of black folks, civil rights leaders, the rest of them, they turned their backs on Haile Selassie. Therefore, if you look at the lost sheep today, they are worshiping a lot of strange gods. There are a lot of strange gods in them and amongst them. But here's what Yahweh says. I am Yahweh thy Elo, Eloheka, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide. The opening of the mouth in Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it with the truth, with the true word. But, but my people would not hearken to my voice. But the lost sheep did not hear and hearken to the king of kings' voice. Only a remnant among the Rastafari and some of the elect Ethiopian Hebrews have heard and listened to the utterance of the King of Kings and recognize this half of our story. But my people would not hearken to my voice and Israel would none of me. So here's a testimony that even though His Imperial Majesty, the true King of Kings upon the throne of David, the throne of David is the throne of Yahweh, the throne of Jehovah. This is real facts. This is real truth. And the only reason that many reject it and don't want to accept it is because of the post-traumatic slave disorder, the Stockholm Syndrome that they're under. If it was a so-called white man or a Jew, white Jewish man, they would recognize it. But because it is a black man, they deny it. They make all sort of excuses. This is why Yahweh says, And Israel would none of me. So I gave them up to their own heart's lust. So we look at black folks for 40 years. Let's look at this 40-year dilemma that we're under and let us do the math. It's very, very important for us to do the math. So I gave them up to their own hearts, lust, and they walked in their own councils. Black folks in the Americas and the Caribbean for the last 40 years have turned their backs on their God and King of Kings, and they've been walking in their own heart's desire and their own lust. But you know what? The game is up. The jig is up. Some are seeing the handwriting on the wall. Others are trying to act like they just can't read, like they don't understand what is written, but it's written very clearly. Oh, that my people had hearkened to me, and Israel had walked in my ways. I should soon have subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. Now, there's a twofold in this. One is speaking of the Ethiopians abroad, those of us, the Beta Israel, so called Afro African Americans, blacks in the Americas and the Caribbean, our foreparents and the civil rights 40 year period of time generation who turned their backs on Ethiopia, on Haile Selassie, on Africa. And then it's also speaking of those Ethiopians and Africans at home who also betrayed the covenant and betrayed the God-man king Ketamawi Haile Selassie and the true African liberation, black liberation, the true work of God in Christ, the real work of God on this earth, which is righteousness and justice. 
I should soon have subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversary. The haters of Yahweh, the haters of Hala Selassie, should have submitted themselves to him. The haters of his imperial majesty, they should have. But you see, what time we're in, we're between 2011 and 2012. We're between a rock and a hard place. And there's an alignment that's happening. Now, another interesting thing is the eight and the one is the nine. And that nine is the highest single number in the universe. That there's no number higher than nine. And nine is also the number of Rastafari revelation. Count it for yourself. Do the math. But their time should have endured forever. You see, those who became haters of his majesty, they would have inherited that Davidic Solomonic kingdom of the king of kings and his Christ, that 3,000-year-old kingdom. But guess what? They lost it. And their time would have endured if they submitted themselves. But now the time is running out. This is the 81st Psalm right here. Now it says, He should have fed them also with the finest of wheat. You see? Now this is the key for understanding what happened in Ethiopia. They say a famine. A famine occurred. And the people turned their backs on their God and their King of Kings. Now, famines have happened in the Bible, throughout the Bible. Abraham is not blamed for the famine. Joseph is not blamed for the famine. Even though they were rulers like kings, they were not blamed for the famine. You see, because there's a, there's, there's a spiritual meaning for famine, but the people were outside the covenant. Here it says, he should have fed them also with the finest of wheat, and with honey out of the rock should I have satisfied. Thee. Now it's interesting because when now this, the 81st, November, and we're talking about, um, just to clarify this here, we're talking about November 2nd, right? November 2nd, 2011 is the 81st coronation of HIM, and we deduce this from the acceptable year. Now, the acceptable year, if you want to get this right here, the acceptable year, you go to Isaiah, right? In Isaiah, let's just put this here, Isaiah 61 and 2, we find the acceptable year, right? 61 and 2, 1930, the coronation of the king of kings of Ethiopia. Now, in 2011, this is 81 years later. Now, what age was his majesty when they said that he was taken off the throne or he died? He was 81 years old. Now, Psalm 81 is interesting, but let's cross over to November 2nd. Let's just look at the futures for a moment. And let's look to November 2nd, 2012. And let's look at the 82nd Psalm. The 82nd Psalm says that God standeth in the congregation of the mighty he judgeth among the gods, the Elohim. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked, Selah? Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. Now, this is very interesting because 2012, they said that, that where the earth and the, the galaxy will be, where this particular solar system will be, it will be passing what they call the dark rift. There's something known as the dark rift. Some say, I think, it's between the signs of, some say, between Scorpio and either Sagittarius, or roughly around that point. And this is where they say the 13th is what they know as the 13th sign, or Ophucius, the serpent bearer. And it's interesting because they say there will be a direct alignment with 
the 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 central the, the, the central primordial sun of the galaxy. There'll be a direct alignment. Now it's very interesting because when it says here that they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. And here's the key. All the foundations of the earth. It's not talking about the, quote, world, but talking about the earth. So it's something that is that has caused the earth foundations to be set out of course. So this is that the earth is, is very regular and, and the solar system has a regular movement. But something is happening at this particular prophetic time in the 82nd scripture. We say that 82, which is next year, would be at 2012, November 2nd. And this is what's happening. It says, I have said ye are gods, ye are Elohim. And all of you are children of the Most High, of El Elyon. But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Interesting. Very interesting. But it doesn't end there. Here's the hope of the blessed resurrection. Arise, O God. Judge the earth. For thou shalt inherit all nations. The truth of Aras Teferi inherits all the remnants from all the nations, from all the tribes, from all the kindred, and from all the people. So there is a resurrection. You see how that connects with Revelation, where it speaks about, I am he that lived and was dead. Behold, I live forevermore between the person of Haile Selassie I, who they say died at 81, but yet the resurrection of Abba Kedus, as well as the ascension and the coming again. Now people say, well, how do we say this? Because when we study in the scripture, we study this right here. There's something interesting when you just take this down and hopefully we'll get into um, a little bit in the forward because we're about to approach the hour the hour point, and we want to keep it within the timing. But take down Hebrews chapter 9, verses 9 to 10. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 9 to 10. And we want you to compare where it speaks of the time of reformation, the theme of the time of reformation. Compare that with Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, verse 21 where it speaks of the time of the restoration. Because we're coming to a time of restoration in the new millennium. Because if you didn't know, 2007 marked the beginning of the Ethiopian millennium. In other words, 2,000 years since the Christ. The real 2,000 year year according to the ancient calendar preserved by the Ethiopians, was 2007. So this, too, is very significant. So we're going to study the link between these two ideas, both the time of reformation, what does the time of reformation mean, how it is distinguished from the time of restoration, and see the personality and the and the person of the son as well as of the father. So my brothers and sisters, may the I of them have a beautifully blessed and a good eighty first coronation of Nagusa Negest Abatachin of Moa Anbesa the Emma Negeta Yehuda Kadamawi. Haila Salase, Suyume Egeziavia, Nukusa Neges, Ze Ethiopia, Be Jesus Christos, Be Getachin Sim. Amen and Amen. Shalom Rastafari.